Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where, let's face it, we get the coolest people in the world on the program. Today, we've got Rebecca Costa. Thanks for coming today, Rebecca. Well, thanks for having me. So you've got a fun definition of complexity, and I think that's a good place to start. What is complexity and where are we headed? Well, when I first became an expert on complexity and they started giving me all of these books and everything, it was just so complex that I thought, you know, we need a simpler definition. And so my definition of complexity is any situation where there are more wrong choices than right ones and the number of wrong choices are exponentially growing. So your odds of actually uh, choosing a perfect solution are almost zero. Those are complex situations. And today we're facing a lot of those where the number of wrong options far and above exceed the number of right options. And, and it doesn't really matter. I mean, we could be talking about going to the grocery store and picking milk. Have you noticed that there are like 20 cases of milk now? Almond milk, acidophilus milk, one and two percent milk. And I, I'm confused. Is two percent twice as bad as one percent for you? I, you know, if you just look at the number of uh, types of milk that you can select from and on what basis are you really choosing, chances are, and they've done surveys on this, you're choosing a slightly healthier option than your mom gave you. And this is why Apple only has a couple products and you can buy a Casper mattress or nothing else. Because when you walk into that shoe store, you don't know what to do when there's so many options. That's exactly right. And there have been many scientists that have written about the, the paralysis that occurs when we have too many options, which is only made worse by the fact that most of those options will not be optimal. And it's interesting that going back even four or five decades ago, we were doing research as scientists on this phenomena of maximizing. And maximizers tend to be these, these, optimal, these people that are looking for the optimal solution and do a bunch of comparisons and a bunch of research. They tend to be overall uh, very low in scores on happiness and contentment in life. They score way lower than the average uh, citizen. And so having all these options, turns out having too many options is just as bad as having none at all. It's like having too, many, too much stuff in your house. You just feel cluttered. Is that kind of where we're headed as a society, as a more cluttered society? Or will AI potentially be able to help with this? Well, that's a good question. I think what happens in all technologies is every technology is expansive and then it contracts down to what the real human need is. And, and it's always going to contract down to how far we've evolved as humans. You know, we can't, we can't get away from the slow rate of evolution. Evolution doesn't move at the pace of technology and human social progress. It never has, it never will. And so while I'm driving my car, while I'd like to have, you know, four other appendages so I can text and drive a two-ton vehicle and drink my coffee and pick up a fax, I need all those things, even just to use the buttons that are already come standard in my car. Um, but we, we, we're not going to get those new appendages, not for millions and hundreds and millions of years, if at all. And so it's, it's very hard to uh, look at technology and say, well, is it good or is it bad? Uh, is it too much? Is it too little? It just is. And so to your point on AI, what AI has done is it's come in to take care of a deficit that our brain has. You know, we are not able to look at billions of options and then narrow them down into some subset that our brain was designed to choose from over three to five options and our brain starts to go into paralysis, we start to release actual chemicals in our body that cause us to freeze and our brain doesn't function as well. And so I would say AI has been long overdue. We need help. We also need to stop eating McDonald's though and we could force people to do it or we could try to get them to change and inevitably a lot of them won't. Do we have to force that on people? Is AI going to be something where it kind of becomes like the mom that maybe you did, maybe you didn't have that's like, sorry, Johnny, that's not even an option. So we're not going to have that in the house anymore. 
No, I think um, AI is going to be uh, so invisible to us. It's already creeping into our lives in terms of narrowing down search engine options when we, you know, go on the internet. There's a lot of things that a that is that, that are already. If you have a stock portfolio uh, with a Charles Schwab or something, and you're getting messages from them that there's a new bond offering or something like that, there's AI in the background because. Remember now, and I, I think the cat's out of the bag and everybody understands this, all of your preferences and information are being accumulated by corporations and organizations and governments all over the world. And so that's allowed them to use artificial intelligence tools to match your preferences and options and, and offers specifically to you. So this idea of vertical marketing has completely gone away. It's now everybody is marketing and aiming and creating a missile specifically for you. And this is how we run targeted neo-Nazi ads on Facebook. Well, pretty much, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, you know, we, can, we, we know who you are. And, and I know everybody's got this big debate about privacy, but the fact, that, the fact is, is that train has already left the station and there is no privacy. There's only privacy in your head. It doesn't actually exist in the real world. And people don't care. They're willing to trade anything for a bit of convenience. Well, that's true. But remember, we're going back. I'm a sociobiologist by training. We're not that far out of the caves. You know, and if something is easier, if there's an easier way to do it, or there's a cheaper way to do it, or there's a way to do it which infringes on us in, in a lesser way, we're going to take that route. That's just human nature. And human nature has not changed. Let's be clear. AI and, and robots and all of this technology, you know, the internet, all uh, Facebook, all of this stuff, is, you know, is, is wonderful. And you know that I've been working in technology for 40 years. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I am a technologist, but I, I have to say that we have to remember and keep in mind that human nature itself doesn't change. I would say it changes, but it doesn't change a lot. So it might change the percentages that we allocate towards different objectives. Now, if you look at evolutionary history, you know, it, within the next, you know, 10 generations, there's not going to be a lot of change in terms of our prehistoric programming. CRISPR? To. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, so so you, you said earlier that evolution's slow, but I would say that evolution's been slow up until now. How do you think about going forward with the potential of gene editing, potential biomechanical enhancements, et cetera, where we start to play God much more so than we have? Well, we don't know what the outcome of that's going to be. I mean, and a lot of people uh, ask me about epigenetics as well, which is a, a kind of a shortcut in, uh, in natural evolution as well. And, and we don't really know what the outcomes of, of that are going to be. It's, it's terrific that we have these tools, but there's nothing to say that human nature in and of itself can be altered. You know, we can, most of the gene editing that I'm aware of, and you know, I try to stay current in the field of genetics, but, but even as a scientist, you know, I, I find every day new discoveries that I'm not aware of. But given uh, that caveat, I would say that, that most of the gene editing that we're looking at right now has to do about disease prevention. That's where the most credible studies are. So we're really trying to get a, um, uh, a you know, uh, uh, to head off certain diseases that we know that people have a high probability of contracting. I would agree, but I think that's the excuses we give ourselves because we don't want to feel like we're doing something wrong, but we all kind of want to do it. And it's like, well, you know, I, I kind of went for that run, so I can probably have that cookie. That's exactly what's happening right now with gene editing. We want to get into that interesting stuff. I want to live longer. I want to be smarter. I want to be sexier. But let's pretend like it's about saving people so that we can get closer because I certainly don't want to be the first one either. What do you think about that perspective? I think that's a very accurate perspective, but again, that's human nature. Uh, there was a very famous philosopher that once uh, said that man is the rational animal. And then a uh, philosopher subsequent to him said, oh, so close. What he meant to say was man is the animal that rationalizes. <laughs> and, I hope, and, I, and I said, yes, actually, the second one is correct, not the first. And I think it would be easier if people realized that, but because we don't realize that, that creates a lot of the problems. 
Well, I think you're right. I mean, we will rationalize what we want to do eight ways from Sunday. And healthcare, if we're saving lives, it's kind of hard to argue with, I don't want to save a life because there could be a downside to it. You know, so yes, uh, maybe we are using that as an excuse to dip our big toe into gene editing. It probably will come about in that way. But you have to remember that human nature is still in charge. And the way that you know that is because when we start talking about using genetic editing for food that we're going to eat in the supermarket, everybody is in just, you know, disbelief and doesn't want to eat food that's been manipulated in that way. And they don't want to eat farm animals that have been manipulated in that way. And, and what is that? Is that a rational decision? If there's really no scientific evidence that there is any repercussion ph physiologically to you to eating something that has you know, become a hybrid uh, through gene editing, then why would you not want to eat those foods? Well, because of human nature. It's distasteful. It's scary. Fear causes us to make irrational decisions. Again, we're going back to human nature. I would say you're half right on that. I think it's science plus a lack of understanding. So what a lot of people don't realize is genetically modified organism doesn't mean anything. It's a, it's a crop that's been edited and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. That's what, right. What or I've, dangerous. Yeah, or, or dangerous. What I've seen good science about though is that the pesticides that they put on that specifically are very negative for the bacteria in your gut. And the reason why they genetically modify these plants is so that they're able to use pesticides that will kill every essentially critter without killing the plants. So what most people don't realize is that the problem isn't the crop. The problem is the chemical being applied to the crop to kill everything except for the crop. But people kind of create a science around this is a bad thing because it's been modified. And really that just has not a lot of credence. Well, let's test your human nature, shall we? Okay. Let's, let's jump five years from now. You know that we're now currently creating nanobots, which are the size of a human cell. These are miniaturized, tiny, tiny robots, right? And in certain cases now, we are testing, spraying these on crops where the plant absorbs the nanobot, and the nanobot is communicating to a watering device outside, whether it needs water or not, what nutrients it needs to produce the greatest yield. It's basically communicating outside of itself, right? Now, the nanobot will continue to operate on a very, very low power, right? And it will produce a great yield. And then when the plant is extracted from the ground, the nanobot will turn itself off. Now remember, this is far smaller than a speck of dirt that you eat with your salad every time you eat salad, right? It's far smaller than that. And it will have no negative health effects. It will also, it also happens to kill all the insects and bacteria that are harmful to that plant. It knows what bacteria and, and insects are harmful and it will automatically annihilate them. But the point is, is that that nanobot will turn itself off and you will ingest it. Does that, now, now let's, let's just check ourselves for a minute. Does that idea of ingesting a nanobot, which will be far healthier than any pesticides, right? And will take care of a great deal of the global food problem. Does that feel good to you? Or do you think, heck no, I'm not eating a nanobot. I think there's two ways to think about it. A, it's the first thing we said before. I certainly don't want to be first. And B, it depends on who's producing these. Is this something that's open sourced or is this something that suddenly Google's going and pulling all by DNA and sending that over to the US government and has all kinds of things that I don't really know is happening on the inside and they have all the proprietary ownership of that. I'm definitely not going to want to be an early one. An insurance company gets a hold of the information and discovers you have an unknown pre-existing condition oh, and denies you insurance. The vampires of the world. So we're talking about going inside your body with microscopic uh, robots, but far better for you than, than pesticides. I agree. I think that people will be terrified of this, but from an agricultural standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, from a health standpoint, it's much better. 
I wonder if they would actually have to be mechanical, though. I feel like you could probably accomplish something similar without a mechanical device. Also, we're, we're, still a way, we're still a ways off from really being able to manufacture at the nanoscale effectively. Not really. No? no not really. We, we've already injected uh, Norwegian rats with nanobots programmed to remove the pre-Alzheimer's plaques to prevent Alzheimer's and been very successful in laboratories. So this is the kind of scary stuff people go, what? And I go, yeah, we already have those nanobots. Now they're not commercially available. And, and again, they're very experimental, but the way that technology moves, I would say they'll be available commercially within the next decade, within your and my lifetime for certain. Yeah, and, like and healthcare will be completely changed by the way. We won't be opening you up and taking out organs and cutting out cancers anymore. What'll happen is you'll be injected with a nanobot that will be programmed to eliminate that. And it will be communicating to the outside world what nutrition you're lacking, what other health hazards you have. Your Fitbit will be communicating to a, a nanobot inside your body that will be telling you what is going on and eliminating most of the disease. You were on a for, affordable care panel a while back and to do a lot of this stuff, the US system doesn't work because a health insurance company doesn't care about saving me money next year. They only care about saving money this year because I might not be their customer next year. Do we, have to, do we have to radically transform that to make any of this work? Ed Wilson said this the best. He said, we have um, paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology, and that that is our condition right now. So my answer, answer is, do the medieval institutions have to go away? You bet, and they will, but they won't go down without a fight. You know, every time I go out to consult with companies, I met with what I call institutional resistance. You know, within that company, they want to continue to do the things that made them successful. It's very Pavlovian. If, if you get a lot of positive reinforcement, you want to continue in that behavior. But technology and change is forcing them, and, they're, and they, they don't like it. And so these institutions, they don't change easily, and they don't go down with a, without a serious fight. And that's why we build a wall, because we got to keep America white, right? That's the, that seems to be the goal. Well, I don't know about the wall, and I'm not even going to touch that. <laughs> it's uh, that, so, sorry. Sometimes I don't want to get like thousands of hate mail. <laughs> oh, I, I I don't mind. So you have an interesting you have an interesting uh, view on the future. You think that the future people have always said the future is unknowable, and I think you believe that to be changing, and I disagree. I think parts of the future are knowable that we never expected to be uh, predictable. Um, it used to be that if we sort of knew a storm was headed our way, we could make preparations. Now, if you look at the weather models that we have, they are by magnitudes more accurate and allowing us to give people several days to evacuate cities and save a lot of lives. Um, the new GOES satellites that went up last year have you know, 30 times the resolution that we've ever had before. So our predictive models have more data on which to be able to predict timing and severity of events. That's just natural disasters. A lot of people are surprised when I tell them we can predict whether an elderly person is gonna trip and fall within an 85% probability in the next week. I know they're gonna trip and fall in the next week and they go, how is that possible? And I say, because we now know that there is a, a very small change in their walking gait that precipitates a trip and fall. And it occurs in 85% of the time. And, and so we can now, I mean, think about it. If we could just eliminate falling for, for the elderly, which frequently causes them to, you know, lose their ability to live independently and they have to go into assisted living. And then it's sort of a downhill from there. So um, it's been estimated that by a, being able to predict when a person's going to trip and fall, that you might be able to extend the amount of time that the elderly can live in their own home and live independently by anywhere from three to five years. And that's, that's really big. So it might, on a small scale and on a large scale, we're just getting very good at putting billions of data points together 
and now uh, making pretty accurate predictions. We're still, you know, in the 80, 85%, but you know how technology goes. It'll go from 85 to 86, 87% until we're really sure we'll be able to tell you, yeah, within 99%, you're going to get lung cancer. We'll be able to tell you within 99%, your house isn't going to make it through the next hurricane. Do you think we fall victim to the data by not looking outside of the trends? A lot of times it's so easy to get caught up in what you're seeing and what the data is telling you that you can't see the bigger picture. I think the data is the bigger picture. I think the data would be the bigger picture if you had the right data. But if you have data that's not necessarily representative of everything, then data is only the picture you're looking at. Well, think about how we make decisions today. Given all the information that's available on the internet, you're, every time you make a, a decision, you're making it based on 0.000001% on a minuscule portion of the available data. This is where artificial intelligence will help us. It will be able to look at massive data sets. And I think when you could look at massive data sets, that's what looking at the big picture really is. There's going to be a lot of wastage in what we look at but it's able to call that in literally nanoseconds down to what our specific interests and, and relevancy is. Do you think that's too much power? Depends on who's using it and what it's used for. As you know, you know, having looked into my background, I, I, every technology and every advancement that we've ever made since the beginning of humankind always has a dark side. Let's not pretend it doesn't. And the example I often use is the fact that the Wright brothers and Charles Lindbergh won a, a lot of peace prizes when they started to perfect flight, particularly over the Atlantic Ocean, uh, because it was believed that if you could shuttle diplomats from one location to another, uh, that this would broker greater peace. Uh, nobody was thinking at the time that we were going to use those planes to deliver bombs across oceans. So. You know, same thing with the internet. Nobody was, when the internet came into existence, we weren't sitting there thinking, well, what about identity theft? What about privacy? You know, corporations collecting all this information on us. We weren't thinking about the downside, the fact that uh, a, a foreign terrorist could shut down our power grid. The, these weren't on our radar. And so we tend to, the progress gets out ahead of the institutions and the laws right? And, and, and human nature. And then it, there's sort of a, a pulling back where, okay, we need to put some parameters, some, some guidelines. We need to uh, create, you know, vi antiviral software. We kind of catch up to it. We're, we're like, um, what do I want to say? It, it, it's like we step too far and we have to come back now and, and protect ourselves from the misuse of progress. Two steps forward, one step back. Is that doable when the steps become bigger though, when they become exponential? I don't know. I don't know that because I, I'm living that now. So as, a, as an evolutionary biologist, I have to see how that plays out. We can't make a judgment that's good or bad because we don't, we don't know. No, but you can make one that's more educated than most. I don't know that I can. <laughs> Thanks for the credit, but I'll give it right back. <laughs> That's wisdom when you're willing to admit that. What are you scared about these days? Um, I, I'm afraid that the people who have the most powerful AI systems and computers know more about future events than the entire rest of the world. And so in some ways, we're, we're, all, um, we're all pawns. You know, when financial institutions have quantum computers, that can do analytics that the person on the street doesn't have access to. Imagine the power of knowing how the stock market's going to do or what oil prices are going to do or where the next war is likely to be or, or you know, what the downstream consequences of um, you know, certain chemicals are uh, to the insurance industry. They're able to use these predictive models to, to really forecast out 5, 10, 15, 20 years and then base their current actions in the present uh, as opportunists to take advantage of that knowledge. And since you and I don't have a quantum computer and we don't have that data and, and we don't have artificial intelligence tools to be able to do that, we are victims waiting to happen.
So I'm not worried about so much about the economic gap in pay. I'm worried about the knowledge gap about future events. That scares me. They've got insider trading laws when it comes to public companies. Do you think they should have something similar for information trading laws? So people that have insider information when it comes to individuals, economies, et cetera, society. How, how, but it's not insider information to use predictive models. It's kind of like going to a casino and you happen to be really good at math, which I am, and sitting at a blackjack table and the dealer tells you there are three decks. If there are three decks, I can't help but count cards. I mean, it's just, it comes naturally to me. We should go to Vegas sometime. I think they'd kick me out of the casino if I, if I went regularly. I, I, I sit there and I see the cards and my, my brain is, na- is mathematically oriented. And eventually I go, no, that dealer's gonna bust. You know, you know, the percentage is he's going to bust is much higher. So it's sort of like, is it, is it illegal to do that if that's what your brain is naturally doing? Well, yeah, the casinos say you can't count cards. So what are you going to do when people have models, right, that they've invested and had software programmers put together that analyze better than anyone else what the stock market's going to do, or what oil prices are going to do. What, what are you going to do? You're going to make that illegal? You're not allowed to create models in your company that predict the future? And then how would you catch anybody? Do we have to change the game then? Because a, a lot of it, it analogizes well to, to pollution. Nobody individually pays the price. Everybody pays the price. So screw it. Let's do it. All right? I, I, I really don't know. It's, it's, it's too messy for our laws to handle, if that makes any sense. I think there are very messy things that laws can't deal with. That's not the only one. You, you know, in some of my previous interviews, I've talked about the fact that we're getting very, very good at looking at personality traits that where people uh, are very prone to commit violent acts. And the example I use is Stephen Paddock. This is a a little bit of a pivot, but Stephen Paddock was the shooter in Las Vegas. And the problem is we always sort of, after an event like that occurs, we go and we backtrack. And suddenly we're discovering that he had all the symptoms of a man reaching criticality, right? We could could look at the weapons that he bought, the fact he, he went on diazepam about six months before, he moved 27 times, he told, he, he sent his live-in girlfriend away, sent her $100,000, told her not to come back to the country. I mean, he had, he had booked multiple rooms that were overlooking concerts. I, I mean, every, we go backwards and we have like something like 180 points as psychologists to be able to say, this guy was hitting criticality. But what could we have done about it? There is absolutely nothing we could have done to stop him. And and the reason is because even after he broke the window and pointed his gun at the crowd, he could have changed his mind. He could have put the gun down, packed it and gone home and said, I'm crazy, I'm gonna gonna get help instead. That, that That was really scary and done nothing. So even with all of this knowledge, what can our laws do? This is really what scares me, is we're going to get better and better at knowing which people are going to commit crimes, but our laws do not have an accommodation for that. Minority report? You can't, well, we, what do you mean at an airport? Like No, scr- my, m- minority report. Oh, minority report, minority, yes. Do you think, do you think we go there or we go towards individual freedoms? Right now, it's individual freedoms. But are there people that want to give up that individual freedom for safety? We're back to human nature again. Yes, people will give up freedom for safety. Which makes it inevitable, right? It's a slippery slope. The slippery slope. And as we get better and better at predicting, what would you want to do if I came to you and said, within 99.9%, your next door neighbor, is going to commit a very dangerous and violent act. That's what the algorithms say. That's what artificial intelligence say. Based on his behavior on the internet, 
what we know about his medical background, everything we know he's going, do, do you want us to come warn you? If you have children in this person's living next to you, you're going to say, can't you do something? Can't you take them away? And the answer is no. No, you can't. And we're, we're getting there. Make no mistake, we are really getting there. I think it's dangerous because we'll think we're there years or decades before we're actually there. I know that they use the cameras now in London to, to face ID people and try to identify people who have been criminals or have committed a crime. And the, the error rates are something ridiculous, 80 to 90% false positive. Yeah. And it's not, we'll, it's not, it's not good. The technology is, is half-baked right now. But even when the te- even when the technology is fully baked, the question is, what do we want as a society? And that's the that's the question that no one's talking about. Everyone's kind of just going with the flow. The flow being, eventually, we get to Minority Report because that's kind of the slippery slope. Governments take power as they can. And that's why I wrote on the verge. I wrote on the verge because I think we have to have that conversation. And you and I are having the conversation right now. And there are a lot of people that will listen to this. We'll propagate this podcast and they'll say, yeah, what are we going to do when we know something is going to happen? How are our laws going to evolve? What are we willing to do? Or are we going to say, we might have known that, but if the price of freedom is minority report, I don't want our society to go there. It will drift in that direction. But how far will we go? China's already going there. The U.S. is moving that way. Europe's going the opposite, except maybe the U.K. It's a, yeah, it's a strange, strange time. It's a strange time. But, but if we stand back, and we've been talking about the big picture, we look at the big picture. What does it mean to collect so much data, right? and begin now to see the patterns in the data and to have those patterns inform us of future events which have not yet occurred. And what does it mean for only certain people in a society to have that information and others to not have it? What kind of a playing field does that create? And how, do our, how will our laws respond to that? How will people respond to that? How will our prehistoric human nature, our instincts, react to those changes? You know, you were saying, well, what scares you? What scares me is we're not talking about it. Yeah, it's KGB oligarchy 2.0. I've seen, uh, <laughs> I've seen studies actually out of Princeton basically saying that the U.S. election system is more or less, uh, I think oligopoly is the term they have, oligarchy, essentially the majority of people have no control whatsoever over what happens. 99% of campaign finance and uh, pushes go into the, the 14 swing states. Everyone else is worthless. It's, uh, well, well you, yeah. you remember how we were earlier talking about this expansion. We go all the way to the edge and then we tend to contract. So we've kind of gone all the way to the edge of only 14 states are going to get money and big corporations are allowed to donate as much as they want, but individuals can't. And we kind of like pushed the limit of that. And now what is the big discussion with the Democratic Congress? Eliminating the Electoral College. It is, but I don't think it matters because it's a winner take all system. We talked um. We had one of the directors from the Center for Election Science on. Essentially, when you have a winner-take-all system, you only ever get two options because a third party will compromise with the second party to overthrow the first party. And for them to remain separate and not become the exact same thing, they have to become more and more different. If you have two pairs of white shoes, you could care less, less which ones you have. Eventually, it's one pair of white shoes. So they have to become more and more extreme. That's kind of what you see happening now, and it's worrisome. It's worrisome, but... You know, we've had, um, we've had difficult presidents in the past, difficult administrations. We've had gridlock in the past. And, you know, it's, it's easy to get emotional and think this is the end. It's, it's like breaking up in a relationship. You think your life is over. And then 10 years later, you look back and you go, oh, you know, it, it was really painful and I learned a lot. And I think that we get so caught up now, particularly with social media and the immediacy of communication on our cell phones and being bombarded by, you know, Twitter and news coming at us so quickly. 
it's really easy to lose perspective and not be able to see the bigger trends, you know, and the bigger evolution of so of society and of, of humans and of ourselves, you know, and I, I think that you've got to always kind of stand back and realize that, you know, we've been on this 300 million plus million year journey. And this is just a tiny, uh, tiny bit of it that, you know, it's, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, the, the movies where they used to flash one frame of popcorn <laughs> and make everybody go eat popcorn. That's what we are right now. That's what, that's what this time is. It's that flash of popcorn that, that makes us do something and we're really unaware of it. I may be cynical, but I think, I, I think I'm more realist. I think it's baked into the system and the people in power don't want to change that system because that system gives them power. Well, again, there's institutional resistance for sure. But remember that that is Pavlovian. If something works for us and gives us goodies, we're inclined to repeat it. This is how the human organism is wired. Um, and, and it's only when it stops giving us rewards that we move on. But we don't let go of our position and our power easily, as history has demonstrated. Especially not when you're a dog and a researcher at once. And that, that's, the, that's the big conflict right there. So you've got 12 principles of adaptation I wanted to jump into. What oh are, goodness, what are those? We have time. <laughs> let's, let's cover them quickly and then we can talk about the most important ones. Well, why don't you pick one and we'll talk about it. To be honest, I don't remember the 12 principles. I could guess and probably get them, but I don't have those in my notes. Well, okay. So uh, a simple principle of adaptation uh, would be um, the one we were talking about, complexity. The more complex a problem is, the more we would be inclined to uh, use fiction to uh, govern our decision rather than fact. Because when we can't get to a fact, uh, either because of time, we have to make a decision, or because there's too much data and we can't sort through all of it, um, or we actually don't have the talent to understand the data. A case like that might be um, you have a number of options for curing cancer, but you're not a doctor. You're not trained as a doctor and you're not going to get your, your doctor degree before you have to make a decision. Um, so what happens in a case like that is that we allow our beliefs to inform our decision. And when we start to rely too much on our beliefs and our opinions and our idea of what is factual, then eventually it's a matter of time before we become highly irrational. So I think that there's a point in time in which many of the decisions we have to make are so complex that uh, we are irrational without knowing we're irrational. The data is out there and we don't know what to do about it. So one of the principles of adaptation really has to do with making sure that we can separate a belief from something that is empirically factual. And that not only takes intellectual honesty, but it also, requires us to invest in getting to the truth and abandoning the biases that we tend to have. We're God awful at this right now. This is, this is the problem in a nutshell. How do we fix it? Well, again, you have to find sources. You, ha you have to, you, you know, um, uh, there are sources on the internet, you know, they're not popular. Uh, um, uh, but there are sources on the internet that are very good at betting information. And you have to give yourself a little bit of time. And again, you have to be intellectually honest about it. If I don't know something, I really have to say, do I believe that or do I know that? Are enough people intellectually and emotionally mature enough for that? I would I, argue no. They are not. They are not. Because, because today because of complexity, opinion is being passed as fact. Beliefs are being passed off as fact. And um, that it's hugely problematic, not only in our individual lives, but even in Washington, DC, you see this very commonly. I mean, you've got, you've got uh, co a Congress 
making legislation on nuclear power when none of them had ever taken a, a you know, a, a physics class. Yeah, they're all white law guys. <laughs> they're all lawyers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so uh, it, it would be good if in leadership we had more scientists that are uh, very good at vetting empirical data. It would, this is where artificial intelligence will be of great help to us um, because it will allow people who don't have the time or don't have the background in a particular area to be able to get to the gist of what they need to look at very quickly and, and stop guessing. So I think that, you know, in a way, artificial intelligence will, will help us to navigate a complex world much better than we are right now. And that is an adaptive technology, right? If, if something is adaptive in that it will help you to get to factual information, to be able to make a rational choice, you want to embrace it as quickly as possible, right? If something is just for entertainment or amusement, like it's gaming technology or something like that, you know, do we really need to embrace that so vigorously? No, I think from a social standpoint, we need to be looking at adaptive technologies that will allow us to, to um, solve some of the problems that we have. And, and of course, predictive analytics that'll prevent people from falling, uh, genetic engineering that will allow us to eliminate disease. Um, nanobots are adaptive technology because they can prevent uh, the onset of, of many diseases. I would agree with all of those, but I would say for the majority, we'll oftentimes think they're ready before they are. And if we have a half-baked solution, we could have a much bigger problem. If we implement that half-baked solution, how do we know when something's ready, when genetic engineering is ready, when AI is ready to start educating or possibly just replacing leaders. If when we it do, works. it works, but what per, think about the trolley problem. Think about autonomous vehicles. What percentage of the time are you willing to get in an accident and die and have that system be the system that you have to use if you assume that the system is perfect and it's in fact not? Well, yeah, are we striving for perfection? No, but if we have a system where we have AI, either AI impacting our leaders or straight up replacing some of the idiots we got, what happens when there's a bug in the system or something we didn't anticipate? We think it's perfect, but then we find out, oh, actually, this is giving three times longer jail sentences to these guys because they're black versus these guys that they're white. Weird, this pattern thing, huh? Did you see what I'm saying? I, I do. What you're talking about is unintended consequences. Yes. And error combined with error rates. And there will always be that. That, that, is, the, that is a natural uh, byproduct of human progress. I'm, I mean, what, what would you, what, what are you suggest? That we sit and we, we, we make all progress illegal until it's perfect? We, we can't. That, that's just not the way the world works. There are always problems. There will be repercussions and there will be misuse and there will be unintended consequences of all human progress. This is the nature of the beast. So, Agreed. That's why I'm playing devil's advocate a little. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if I like it, don't like it. Uh, artificial intelligence will give us a bit of a leg up because through predictive analytics, we'll be able to eliminate more of those future downsides than we have been able to in the past. But I throw in a caveat there, but will we? Just because you know what could potentially happen on the downside, I, which may be your point here, doesn't mean you'll do anything about it. You may let it happen, as in the Ford uh, exploding gas tank in the Pinto. Yeah, right? we, know, we know we should need a McDonald's, and yet some people still do. We, well, of course, you know, be, and, and again, we're back to this human nature butting up against social and technological and scientific progress. You know, uh, uh, when, look, only a hundred million years ago, food was, was an issue. Every day we had to get a certain number of calories to, to survive. It turns out that climbing a tree to get an apple, sugar, primarily sugar, 
that tasted good. The calories we expended to climb the tree to get that apple were more than the apple was worth. We still have that genetic drive that's tied to our survival. We still need to eat and we still look for sugars. Big lights going off in everybody's head. Sugar, we're sugar seeking organisms, make no mistake. But today, that DNA, you know, those DNA instructions are still in my body. And then every corner, there's a Starbucks with a case of donuts. And we say to people, well, you don't have self-control. We're very judgy about that. You don't have self-control. You need to exercise more. Are you kidding me? In, in nature, you want to get as many calories as you can, and you don't want to expend them unnecessarily because you might a predator may come try to eat you, and you need that burst of energy. That was tied to your survival. So bear in mind, social progress has nothing whatsoever to do with how we're instructed. And so uh, you invent something wonderful like the internet, and we, we got people that are going, I can cheat people. <laughs> Cheating and lying. You know, we've done, we've done experiments with bonobo monkeys to see if bonobo monkeys would lie. And they lie. Guess what? And other animals lie. Your dog will lie if it'll get them some more food. It gets, it gets even better. They did an experiment where they tried to see if monkeys could replicate a human economy. And they gave them little coins. They could trade the coins for either brownies or cookies. One day a brownie would be two cookies. The next day it might be three or one. And they would alternate this. And over the months, researchers would give them coins every day. And the monkeys would go and they would, as the currency exchange rates between the different snacks changed, their preferences would change. So that alone is mind boggling that another creature could do that. But then at the end of the study, or at least the highlight of the study, uh, at the end, guy monkey goes up to a girl monkey, has sex, hands her the coin, and the girl monkey goes off to buy a coin. Even monkeys have prostitution. And I think it, it points out that- economy. Yeah, well, it's, it's all, we're all animals. It's, uh, it's crazy. And, and, and the fact is, is that we look at those bonobo monkeys by which, it, and we share, you know, over 95% of our genetic material with them. We've broken down the human genome, so the cat's out of the bag. We are sophisticated bonobo monkeys with godlike technology. It's true, what Edward Wilson said. We have this godlike technology. So let's not act so shocked when we misuse it or, or it's imperfect and we roll it out too soon. I think that your cautionary concern that it won't be perfect and we're going to you know, roll it out and how many people will die from driverless cars in the process of perfecting it, I don't know, but I will tell you there will be some. That I know. I'm not worried as much with driverless as when the nuclear systems are on an AI AI shot clock, so to speak, or something else. The uh, driverless cars, if you're killing one, two, five people at once, it's much slower. It's the same reason that selling AR-15s is a problem and selling pistols is less of a problem. It's the amount of damage you can do at once. So you're only concerned about the big damage. <laughs> no, I think the, the big, I think the big damage is what's changed. So in the past, we've always had technology where, holy God, we created this massive train that can run people over oh, we created a grenade that you can throw in someone's house and blow them up. It's a small scale thing, but what happens when we create the grenade that blows up the entire earth? Then you only need once. It doesn't matter if it's 1%. It doesn't matter if it's a tenth of a thousandth of a percent. It's a much larger existential type risk. You've got to give it much larger than the percentage possibility uh, value or magnitude towards trying to prevent that. That's how I think about it. I think it's an important way to think about it. Um, and, but remember, we've had, this cap we've had nuclear capability for a very long time. And that the, and the, only, you know, the only nefarious use has been during wartime. I will say that this is like our popcorn slide, though. As you've brought up before, we've had it for a very short percentage of humanity. Yes, we have. And, and it remains to be seen 
how it will be misused, whether it will be misused. It's just too early to tell. You know, it's, it, there are many things that it's too early to tell how it shakes out. But one thing we do know is there's a battle going on. It's a moral and ethical battle. There are groups of people that are asking the right questions and having the right conversations. Maybe not at the top and maybe not at the very bottom. But in the middle of society, I find more and more as I go around the country and travel around the world and, and engage in speaking to big conferences and large audiences, people are not only aware that there's an existential shift going on, but they want to engage in dialogue about it. They want to, they want to talk about it. And, they, and, and we may not have all the solutions, and the solutions we have may be uh, terribly imperfect, but we'll get there. We'll get there. And I, and I think we'll get there long before somebody blows the earth up. Uh, with, you know, because look, if anybody was going to do it up to this point in time, it would have been the leader of North Korea, <laughs> who's a bit unhinged from what we can tell. Or, or Trump, one or, one or the other. Maybe they would play a fun game. Uh, who knows? You know, who knows? It's, it's hard to say. But for those people who are very concerned about Trump, I would say we have had uh, scary presidents before, and we've survived it, and we will survive this. As long as no one touches the toupee, we're good. So this <laughs> is a, that's the purpose of this podcast, though, to get incredible people like you on and have these really challenging, thought-provoking conversations. If you guys like this, disruptors.fm slash Patreon, consider supporting us so we can keep doing it. I have two last questions for you, Rebecca. And the first one would be, I want a bold prediction 20, 25 years out. What's something that most people aren't expecting that you think will be a reality? Well, it's what I mentioned before. Healthcare will be completely disrupted. We're right now struggling with how to pay for it and you know, what insurance companies are doing it and whether people are entitled to it. And we're addressing a lot of different issues, but I think that those issues will be resolved through technology. And I think that nanobot technology, the ability to to resolve an, uh, a, a disease before it needs to be cured is really where healthcare will go. And so we won't be trying to take care of your cancer after the fact. The problem with healthcare right now is it's, it's, it's always too late. It's after you've exhibited symptoms. So where technology will go is that we will be able to take care of you before you're sick and, and uh, intervene beforehand. And that's going to be very radical and it's going to effectively annihilate the insurance business. I sure hope so because they, they along with politicians are just the scumbags of the earth. It's, uh, it's, it's the one industry that's net negative where you just put money into it and there's not actually net benefit that goes out. It's only collective benefit. The, the, it's, the, that, in, that industry will virtually be gone and replaced by something that, that deals with prevention. I would hope so, but I think that there will be so many new insurances that get created that we have, uh, they stay readily employed in the future. I think insurance is one of those things that just expands, unfortunately. Remember that insurance is always betting on something bad happening to you. And predictive analytics and AI are all about preventing the bad thing from happening to you. That's the simplest way I can put it. So that insurance model doesn't work anymore when you are investing all of your resources in preventing the negative, you know, because the insurance is there to, to, as a risk mitigator, but you no longer need a risk mitigator if you can eliminate the downside up front. So that's a way of looking at it. Which would mean healthcare becomes insurance as well. And it becomes one bundled thing because you always do need to back up just in case. Yes, but healthcare will be our insurance. I and sure so hope so. It would be so much cheaper. Really, it, it's going to be a really major change in the healthcare market and the way we look at it and everything else tied to it. Pharma will go away because you're not going to be taking 
drugs and poisoning your whole body to get rid of a specific disease, not if nanobots can care for it. So again, everything associated with healthcare is going to go through a major transformation. And in, uh, in my book, it will happen within the next decade. I sure hope so. rather radical. But those okay. industries are, are in for it. I, they need to be. They're dinosaurs that cost too much money with terrible results to date. I have one last question for you, Rebecca. I know you're busy. I need to go, you know, you need to go save the world and save babies from burning buildings and all of <laughs> yes, that I incredibleness. Do. I to go save the world. <laughs> if you had to leave people with one thing before you tell them where to find you, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything, what would it be and why? It would be the quote I gave you earlier from Edward Wilson, the, uh, the greatest naturalist in the world out of Harvard University, where he said, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. That is the era that we live in, right? So it's very important to acknowledge when your instincts and, and your primitive uh, urges are driving a decision. It's very important to realize that institutions have to change and we have to be part of that change. And it's important to know that there's an up and a downside to every technology. And as long as we can see what that downside is, we have a moral imperative to act on that ahead of time. And we've never had that luxury before. And I'm hoping that we'll use that advantage. Great power, great responsibilities. Edward Wilson, is he the same as E.O. Wilson, the futurist? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's a, he's, a pretty, he's a pretty great one. You guys should check him out. And you guys should check out Rebecca. Where is the best place for them to find you? RebeccaCosta.com. And the name of the book is On the Verge. Absolutely. And what's, the, what's On the Verge about again? It's again about predictive analytics and the fact that we know more about the future than we've ever known before. And we're compelled to do something about it. We are compelled to do something about it. Let's make a better future, guys. That's the purpose of the podcast, to get people making a better future and inspire others to do the same. Thanks for tuning in today, and thanks for coming on, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Till next time, go do something incredible. (laughs) Awesome.